Well, good morning, Bob. The first time at this church, we are so happy to welcome you to this time of worship that we call the path. Um, seeing a lot of faces that that we know and some faces that are more new. Um, the path is our contemporary worship service. So, um, our this our worship is contemporary, but we still we still take what we do very seriously here, and we are we're very happy to see everyone. We are about to get started with a time of music and worship this morning, um, and we will have a prayer. I'd like to pray over this church, and then we will get started. Well, Father, we thank you for everyone here, every life here, after so much that has been going on the last two weeks, but. Father, let us set aside this hour to be with you and to fellowship with one another. Come, Holy Spirit, and flood this place and make us present here just as you are. Father, we love you. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, I invite you to stand with us as we begin with the time of worship and song this morning. There's a place where I love to run and play. There's a place where I sing new songs of praise. I'm dancing with my father God in fields of praise. I'm dancing with my father God in fields of praise. Thank you. 
Good to see everybody here. Again, I want to tell you that we're glad to see you. I know it's a challenge right now with all we're going through as a community to be here. Let me get this on. I almost forget I'm wearing it sometimes. Um, but we are so glad to see you here today. And uh, I know it's a special effort to get here for many of you because some of you still don't have power. I know. And uh, you're just dealing with all of that. Uh, our community, of course, has been hit so hard. And we are working as a church to try to uh, respond to some of the needs this past week. Uh, we uh, gave out about 100 meals. Uh, and thank the Lord for Richie Martin, who was able to cook those, and we were able to just box them up and send them out. But we want to do more of that. So if you're available and able to help, uh, we want to be able to, uh, as, as the needs are known, and we know that we can maybe feed a line crew somewhere or take it to uh, first responders or something, we want to be able to, to do that this week. And so the other thing is we are hoping to get to uh, – our depot uh, in Lafayette at Asbury United Methodist Church and bring supplies which will be given out through that front uh, office there uh, where confirmation normally is. So if you're able to do that uh, and help us give out supplies, water, uh, other things uh, that we'll be bringing down from Lafayette, please let us know if you're able to help with that. So you'll hear more about that. We watch on social media uh, through Facebook especially. And we'll let you know when the call out comes uh, for when we can help. And speaking of things that kind of got delayed from this past week, uh, we hope to start our classes this past Wednesday. But since a lot of people didn't have power, and especially when the church didn't have internet, uh, we are going to move that back a week. So we'll start our classes this coming Wednesday. Uh, Pastor Mary Rachel at 11 o'clock and me at 7 o'clock. Her class is the class meeting, and mine is anxious about nothing. I'm holding these two books because we have books for you if you sign up for the course, uh, and they are uh, at the front office there where Amy sits, and there's a basket. If you've got the money, $15 to pay for the book, um, throw it in there. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, you have to pay for it right now. We can collect it later. Uh, so please uh, avail yourself of picking up your books and we'll start the class this coming week. Provided we don't have another hurricane. <laughs> but nothing else like that happens. So um, anyway, well, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, are there any other announcements? Anybody else? Well, church, I would invite you to stay with us again as we continue in our time of worship. Oh, my dreams in my darkest hour. 
Father God, we thank you so much. We, we just come to you again. Just saying thank you for the blessing of another morning of this church getting together and getting to be together. Dear Lord, just your you're moving in this place this morning. So Father, just, just let us continue in that spirit. Just let us just let us be bathed in your spirit this morning, Father. We've we've lifted our voices together in song. We've we've heard of the ways that we will be coming together as a church, both in study and in helping one another in light of the devastation of Hurricane Laura. We are going to hear from Pastor Mary Brazier this morning. And Father, just all, all this time, this fellowship and just communion with you, just let us let us stay in that presence and let us stay in that place. And as we continue on this morning, let us also bring our voices together to pray that prayer that your son, Jesus Christ himself, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Lord. Amen.
may be seated. Thank you to all of you who came as you are this morning, whether you came as you are to this place or you come as you are joining us online. We're so glad that you are with us. Our text from this morning comes from the book of Romans. Many of you probably know that Romans is probably one of Paul's letters to the early church. Uh, it's a little different from some of the other letters that Paul wrote in a, in a few ways. Um, first, because it seems that Paul hadn't actually met the Romans yet. Uh, the Ephesians and the Philippians and the Colossians, he had been a part of planning all those churches, and he knew them very well, particularly in Philippians. He talks about how much he loves those folks. He knows them very dearly. But when he writes to the church at Rome, he hasn't actually been to Rome. This is his introductory letter. Um, he wants to meet them, and probably it is his plan to go first to Rome and then hope maybe get their support so that he could go on to Spain to spread the gospel. So he's gone this great arc from Jerusalem across the east, and he's going towards Rome when he writes this letter. So he's not really um, addressing the specific problems that he does in the other letters. This isn't the pastoral letter in that he knows these people well and he knows the struggles that they're going through and so he's giving them particular advice. Instead, Paul writes in the middle of this letter, he calls it a reminder. A reminder of what it means to be Christian, to follow Christ. Um, the, the Romans, uh, the, there's some that we don't know, but probably they were a church that began out of the synagogues, and many of them had been Jewish Christians, Jews who became Christians, and then there were converts who had been Gentiles. And then we you know that the Jews were actually expelled from Rome for as long as maybe eight or ten years. So those original founders of the churches were gone, and then they came back. And so Paul writes to them, about this um, central problem that the first Christian, the first century Christian church had. How do we um, be Christian if we're not Jewish? Like what parts of the Torah really apply to us and what parts don't apply? And this is something that uh, the early Christians faced in Acts and would again face later is, do we need to be circumcised? Do we need to eat kosher? Which rules do we have to follow to follow Jesus? So this is where the church was at that time. A pretty confusing time. A large empire, an empire that had the power to send them away from their homes. Um, and then they were back together trying to figure out how to be community. So let's let this uh, letter speak to us today. So I begin in the 13th chapter, beginning with the 8th verse. Owe no one anything, except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not cover, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as of the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ to make no provision for the flesh, to gratify its desires. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Can you pray with me now? Strong and steadfast but God, we come to you in a time of uncertainty. We come to you in a time where we need to be reminded of what it means to follow you. We come to you and we know that you are love. We know that you will give us hope. We 
know that you will reassure us. Bless this preacher. Bless the words that come out of her mouth. Let your Holy Spirit be in this place so that all that we may hear may make us more and more like you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Fifteen years ago, uh, I was in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, I'd worked logistics for Outward Bound. I'd been driving 15 passenger vans and loading trailers and packing snack mix into bags and cleaning backpacks and rain gear all summer long. But the fall came and our base camp cook uh, decided to go back to school, so although I was barely qualified, I stepped into cooking for the community. So I was in the kitchen, listening to the radio for days. Days and days of coverage. They talked about Chocotulis Avenue and the Aquarium of the Americas. They played the brass bands, and for the first time in my life, I felt like I knew what the psalmist meant when she said they made her sing the songs of Zion in a strange land. Some of the preachers on television talked about the hurricane as a punishment for the sin of New Orleans. All I knew was grief. I felt sadness like I had when my mama died. I love the city of New Orleans. And when they came, the keepers of the aquarium and the generators had run out and they couldn't circulate the water anymore and so the seahorses had died. I, uh, I think I crumpled to the floor and I wept. <laughs> I know it's silly to cry for seahorses when so much has been lost. It's just silly. But uh, that aquarium opened when I was eight, and I was enchanted. And on my 12th birthday, my family took my best friend to New Orleans, and I stood and I watched the penguins for as it was my birthday, and that's what I wanted to do. My best friend and my family walked around the whole aquarium and saw everything else. That's all I wanted to do was watch the penguins. There was so much loss, but that poor animal keeper who had to watch all those fish die. I felt so powerless. I was a thousand miles from home. And people were talking about New Orleans like she was disposable. Like we could just throw away a city of a half a million people and 300 years of history and music and dancing and songs. So I went back, not that day, not that fall, but in April 2006, the Reverend Sean Anglum, who had been in the campus ministry at the Wesley Foundation in, at LSU, asked if I would serve as an AmeriCorps volunteer in New Orleans. So in August 2006, I moved into First United Methodist Church in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's First Grace United Methodist Church now, but that's a whole different story. I want to tell you about Tom. Tommy and his wife came down in their camper from North Carolina. Tommy was an UMCOR volunteer. That's United Methodist Committee on Relief. Some of you are probably familiar. They came down from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Tommy is one of those guys who can fix anything. Some electrical, some plumbing, some carpentry. He's gifted. He can fix things and make them work. I did a lot of different things as an AmeriCorps volunteer that year. I tutored kids in an elementary school and helped clean a community garden, and I bought some houses, and I did canvassing for a neighborhood organization, and sometimes I went to Lowe's with Tommy. I learned to love Tommy, and he loved that church, and he loved New Orleans. He loved us. He didn't owe us anything at all, but he loved us. I don't think he'd ever been to New Orleans before Katrina, but he came and he stayed, going home with his wife to visit their grandchildren occasionally, but he showed up day after day and he did what needed to be done. He fixed things, small things, one after another in a city where just about everything was broken. 
I want to tell you about Jennifer. I mentioned earlier that I canvassed for a neighborhood organization. Some of you may know that neighborhood organizations were crucial in the recovery effort in New Orleans. When FEMA and the city and the state were deciding where to send funds and what to fix and what street came first, it mattered if you had a neighborhood organization who could advocate for your house and your street and your neighbors. A woman named Jennifer led the Mid-City Neighborhood Organization, and I helped pass out flower, flyers, gather lists of needs, and put out chairs for me. Jennifer had two kids and she was living in a trailer in 2006, but she rallied her neighbors to bring back her home. She also started a restaurant the next year. She called it the Ruby Slipper, because like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, for Jennifer, there was no place like home. Home was New Orleans. Home was Mid-City. She loved that neighborhood. In August 2016, Hurricane Matthew flooded Lumberton, North Carolina. I worked as a pastoral intern at Swepsonville, United Methodist Church in Swepsonville, North Carolina, in 2018. I'll be surprised if any of you have ever heard of Swepsonville. You may think Pineville's small. Well, <laughs> they're smaller. Uh, Swepsonville's a little mill town near Graham, North Carolina really sweet little church. Some folks who've been going to that church for 80 years. And while I served with them, we went to Lumberton for a few days to help hang new insulation and paint a house that was almost ready for a family to return to. While we were meeting to talk about safety at the local United Methodist Church, I heard a familiar laugh. I saw a familiar face. There was Tommy. Yeah, Tommy from New Orleans, from Fayetteville. I th think I'd seen him once in the decade between the year I spent with him in New Orleans and that day in Lumberton. I forget exactly what his job title was that day, but he was leading um, or and the disaster relief in North Carolina from the hurricane that had hit Lumberton and they were still recovering from two years later. He didn't know them a thing, but love. The guy who led our team in Lumberton that day did what Tommy had done in New Orleans, said something about Umpore and the United Methodist Church. He said, we're not usually the first ones there in a disaster but we're the last ones to leave. The last ones to leave. This is how we follow Jesus. This is how we worship. This is what Paul talked about in the Romans, that it was our love that was true worship. Well, we've had another hurricane. I've heard that it was the most powerful to hit storm to hit Louisiana in 150 years. I've seen some pictures of Lake Charles. And a week ago, last Thursday, I was sitting in my den feeding baby Jack breakfast on the floor. The power was already out, the dining room was dark, so we sat by the window and I heard a loud boom. And I looked out our back windows to the neighbor's yard to see if they were down, but I didn't see it big. Within a minute, that same neighbor came running over to check on us. The large old oak tree in our front yard had come down. It was resting on our roof above my bedroom in the living room. It had knocked off the top third of our chimney. The next day, my Uncle Joe, who owns a house, came over to tarp the roof, and he and his friend Joe put the ladder up and tested the roof for weight bearing before they stepped on it. It was soft. The ridge line was broken, and they couldn't climb safely to get onto the roof. Love does no harm. Love does not hurt. 
Sometimes when we love, we have to be careful. Careful to know that the roof can hold us so that we can fix it. Careful to know that we're doing not just the kind thing, but the right kind of thing at the right time. When Don Wesley set up early societies that were the forerunner of the Methodist Church, he gave them three rules. They're called the general rules. Um, they are still a part of the Book of Discipline, and in my opinion, one of the best parts of that long collection of agreements we have with each other. Briefly, they are do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Mr. Wesley went into great detail about what each of those mean. I think he was referring to something that Paul said to the Romans. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Do no harm. Don't make things worse. I mean, sometimes we're slow and deliberate in our response. Sometimes we don't get up on the roof until the crane comes. Sometimes that makes us different from other folks. I don't think we're necessarily better, but different. It's just the way that we have been, and we probably will be. We had a tree on our house last Thursday at 9. Our neighbor ran over to check on us. He invited us over to his home. We went over there until the winds died down. After the winds died, we looked and we decided we could stay in the back of the house without being under the trees. So we did for two nights, but like most of you, we didn't have power. It was hot and we didn't have a generator and we have a one-year-old. <laughs> so <laughs> when he couldn't sleep, we couldn't sleep. And my cousin invited us to New Orleans to stay in an apartment in her basement. I think it's worth you knowing that my cousin lived in the West Bank when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. And she came to Alexandria and she stayed. So I went to her house and we stayed in her basement. And we were checking Facebook and calling family and hearing about how things were going and trying to figure out when we could and should go back. But Monday morning, we thought it was getting close, but we wanted to wait a little bit longer to know that we had water for the baby before we came back. And uh, so we took Jack to the Aquarium of the Americas. And we walked around, and he loved the fishies. Felt so strange. But then, after we'd walked through the aquarium, um, I decided to look at my phone to find a place to have lunch. And two blocks from the aquarium now is the Ruby Slipper, Jennifer's restaurant. So we took him, and we had French toast, egg benedict with shrimp. Pork sausage and tomatoes. And it was delicious. And I saw that sign that she hangs in the restaurant and she talks about feeling like Dorothy and what it is to come home again. And I wonder at the miracle of it all. Yes, there is some miracle that we were in the back of the house when the tree fell on the front of the house and it was 9 o'clock in the morning and we weren't in bed. And there is some miracle that when the tree fell, the limb caught it in our front yard and held it so it didn't come all the way through the ceiling. It just busted through the roof into the attic. And it will be fixed. And that is some miracle of God working in nature. And I hope you know some story like that. But so is Jennifer of Europe. And so is Tommy. So are each of us living into this promise, this promise of a life of love, of checking on our neighbors, and taking Gatorade to the linemen, and 
providing a meal, and taking someone in, and also receiving that love, knowing that it's okay to ask for help, to be taken in, to be fed. Because as much as we know the power and wonder of God through nature, how we might be saved from storms, so also we know the love of God through each other. That year I spent in New Orleans was hard. It was long. But I know that I felt the movement of the Holy Spirit. That day in Lumberton, I was hot and sweaty and frustrated with a member of the church. But we loved one another. We are invited to love. And the Holy Spirit comes among us, between us, through us, breathes into us and blows wind mightier than any hurricane reshaping us, reforming us, making us more like the one who teaches us. Thanks be to God, who is love. Thanks be to God, who gave us his Son to show us the way of love, who by the whole power of the Holy Spirit is with us even now. Friends, will you pray with me? Good and holy God, we are in wonder at your power. We live in wonder at your might. And we are desperately grateful for your love this week. For the mercy you have shown us. For the mercy you have shown us in bringing us through this storm for the mercy you have shown us in the love of our neighbors, for the mercy that you will show to the world through our love. Bless us so that we may be good instruments for your use. Bless us so that we may shoot, truly show your genuine love to the world. We ask all this in the name of your Son, who is redeeming. Church, would you stand in this place?
that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. I only want to remind you, I only want to remind you who you are and whose you are. Go out then into this world and worship this week. Worship with your love. Love your God and love your neighbors.